which is Amazon Publishing's science fiction and fantasy imprint. I, I will be your moder to the moderator today. So before we get started, I wanted to make sure that you all knew there was a room switch. Um, this is not the panel on space and super superpowered chickens. I kid you not, there is a panel on space and superpowered chickens in one room over, and we were originally assigned to that room, but we got moved. <laughs> so <laughs> while that does sound pretty awesome, we're actually here today to talk about rebellion and resistance in science fiction and fantasy literature, and I'm really glad that you all are here with us. So I also know that this coincides with the Star Wars Rebels panel. Um, I can pretty much guarantee you they're not going to talk about the fate of Ahsoka Tano, which is like the only reason why I would go anyway. So <laughs> anyway, with that, I am pleased to introduce our panel. From seemingly small acts of defiance to full-scale rebellions, the characters of science fiction and fantasy have led us to victory against all types of villains. Are these acts of resistance simply for literary pleasure, or do they carry a greater weight? Today, our panelists discuss how they use speculative fiction to shine a light on current events and social issues, and also, perhaps, hopefully, provide a path towards the future. Um, I'm going to try to leave 15 minutes at the end for audience Q&A, and after the panel, most of these lovely people up here are going to be signing their books at tables two and three out in the hallway area. So, to my right side are my panelists. First, we have Ashley and Leslie Saunders. They're the authors of The Rule of One. These twin sister author filmmakers were born and raised in Texas and currently live in Los Angeles. Their Rule of One series has been optioned for TV by MRC, the studio who did House of Cards and Ozark, and the second book in the series comes out May 7th. So. Next is Jeff Wheeler, the Wall Street Journal best-selling author of the Harbinger series and the King Fountain series. A husband, father, and full-time writer after taking an early retirement from Intel, Jeff lives in the Rocky Mountains. His latest novel is Prism Cloud. <laughs> then we have Meg Elison, author of the Road to Nowhere series. Meg's debut novel, The Book of the Unnamed Midwife, won the 2014 Philip K. Dick Award. Her second novel was a Dick Award finalist, and both were longlisted for the James A. T Trip Tree Award. Her latest novel, The Book of Flora, comes out next month. There it is. And finally, Sumeya Dawood, author of the debut Mirage. A writer and PhD candidate at the University of Washington, Sumeya is also a former bookseller in the children's department at Politics and Prose in Washington, D.C. She is passionate about Arabic poetry, the stars, and the Gothic novel. All right. So, Meg, I'd like to start with a question for you, cool. but I also want to emphasize to everybody that I really consider this a discussion, so if at any point you have something to add, then p please feel free, even if it's not directed at you uh, initially. So, Meg, yes. reproductive freedom is a big part of the unnamed midwife, and unfortunately, it's kind of a hot-button topic right now. Um, how can we, or can we, <laughs> avoid the post-apocalyptic vision of your book and keep each other safe? And is it kind of a cautionary tale about what not to do? I think just about everybody who writes science fiction is in some way writing a cautionary tale, right? We're either writing what we hope the world will become or what we're desperately afraid that it will become. Uh, I have been, since I started writing this series, desperately afraid of the future of reproductive freedom, but I'm, I'm hardly the first author to do that. I mean, Margaret Atwood was writing The Handmaid's Tale back in the 70s, and she was looking at a world that had just recently, uh, a country at least, that had just recently legalized abortion. So the terrible thing is that these uh, laws that protect people who can bear children just keep sliding us backwards, and uh, it's a terrifying time to be alive, am I right? <laughs> Uh, so these, these books are, are born of that terror, and, uh, and it's, it's not enough to write about it. It's not enough to resist and rebel in our dreams. It's also given me the impetus to start escorting patients into Planned Parenthoods and stockpiling uh, Plan B so I can give it to my friends. And 
Uh, I remember on the night of the election in 2016, I grabbed my little sister by the back of her shirt and asked her if she had the five-year IUD or the 10-year IUD, because these are questions we're going to have to start asking. So I, I think the greatest challenge and the, the best thing I can motivate people to do is to take all the leverage that you can, weaponize any privilege you possess, and put it toward keeping everybody free. Because if everybody's not, 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 if everybody's not free, nobody is free. Ashley, Leslie, do you have anything to add to that? You have sort of the, some of the same reproductive themes in your book. Oh, yeah, I mean, you want to talk? Yes, so in our book, um, we have a one-child policy. So families, after they have their firstborn, everybody is sterilized. So in ours, we kind of um, explore what it would mean for men to also have their reproductive freedoms taken away, mm -hmm. which, is, which has been interesting to uh, discuss that with people because, you know, nobody, a lot of, that sort of um, in stories always talks about women's reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. And in present day, yes, yes, it is. I know. Do you have anything to say, Leslie? I know. I mean, I, she pretty much nailed it over there, so she could. I'm just going to let her gonna you know, let that, uh, speak that. on that one. <laughs> so, for anyone, uh, anyone on the panel, in times of social unrest and economic hardship where we sometimes find ourselves, um, do you think that people want to read dystopias to kind of like contain and structure those fears or maybe maybe utopias to kind of rise above them or do they really want to escape with fantasy? Um, can science fiction predict the future? Does art imitate life or is it the other way around? That's a bunch of questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to answer all of them. Is this a why? Just anyone can answer this? Yeah, yeah. anyone. When, when we wrote, when we wrote our dystopian, um, we were in the Obama era, and we very much thought that not any because in our book, it, uh, government is a fascist government. It's totalitarian. Um, the governors take control of their states, border and walls. there's border walls. And there's surveillance and microchips, and we very much thought we were just writing um, speculative fiction. But we thought that our book takes place 70 years in the future, so we thought this could possibly happen in 100 years, uh, you know, maybe in 1,000 <laughs> years. And but it, and it got released, you know, post Trump, and now we get a lot of questions on are you writing to Trump? But really, we're just. It's scary how, when you're writing speculative fiction, it, we're a lot closer to already happening, and it's been Because we were very much writing a cautionary tale based on climate change, because we think that the government can um, take control and use fear-based politics to really um, enact policies that are for the benefit of a few. And, um, and we very much took our background from Texas, being from a conservative background, and our girls and our, char our characters, Ava and Mira, are from Dallas. So we, we took our background being from Dallas and uh, wrote about it. Um, and it's interesting because we have a very conservative family, and we tried to, in our book, not be so much um, le you know, lecture-based with trying to just really just hit the politics on it, but create characters that people can identify with from all backgrounds and if you can identify with the main characters and then you put side characters in there that people can identify with because they main characters do right. and you can change minds through that way um, because we've tried lecturing to our family and we've had arguments <laughs> and it just doesn't work but they like the book but they all it's 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 interesting because yeah. then they read uh, speculative fiction dystopians, and then they read our they book, can and they can recognize, and then and they I, they are pro Avon Mira, and they're like resist. Right. And we're like what? <laughs> <laughs> you voted for you, you voted for Trump. What? I think that's one of the things that stories does better than uh, writing, say, philosophical essays or or you know diatribes on the <laughs> internet. Like reading a novel will do something for your ability to feel empathy that writing uh, that reading people's Facebook posts will not do. Uh, I think one of the better things about writing dystopias, as you suggested in your question, uh, is that it takes a long time to feel as though you're not the only one who feels this way. And dystopias recognize these collective fears and give us a place to put them and, and, and rationalize those fears and validate you. I remember on the d when the Women's March started, the, the best part of that day was walking outside my front door and saying, oh good, it's not just me, you're all seeing this. <laughs> 
and that, that utopias do the opposite and they, they give us a place to put those collective hopes and give you the idea that you're not the only one working toward this. And I think it's amazing that your conservative family can see all that in your books because that is what fiction does. That is the truth in I fact. It really lie. does. I know. And then they're giving it to their friends and their family. And I'm like, are you really? Because I've seen your friends in, on Facebook. <laughs> and, I don't think that's happen. and then and the next thing you know, they're posting about it. And, yeah. and, like and spreading the word. I'm like, wow, this is, r you know, we're infiltrating the Dallas and Fort Worth community in Texas. <laughs> one person at a time. Lord's work. But except for, you know, the whole Beto just announced that he's running for president. Run. Yeah. And yeah. Um, he's well, Texan. We're hoping to so I'm hoping he can Texas have a totally blue. different light on Texas and turn it blue. All right. <laughs> Jeff, what about you? You write fantasy. So do you approach it from a different viewpoint? Well, I, um, I don't write dystopian, but my uh, my new series is kind of a regency that's dystopian because it's not, you know, Queen Victoria. It's it's about military and it's about, you know, a society that's very much a haves versus haves not. And I've had readers say, it's like, wow, are you, is this a parable about today? And it's like, yeah. you could look at the British Empire and you could see the same kinds of things that we're seeing today. And so I, I really look at these characters, you know, having one character from one stratus of society and another one from the other you can really I think by having those characters interact with each other you can really show people that and, and people see their own similarities to what's going on in our, our world today right right you and and Sumeya too um, do you think that because of the sort of imagined era that you're writing in the form of government would change the way the rebellion in your book looks like if you were writing contemporary or from a democracy, for instance, um, would, would the rebellion, would the resistance look different? I don't know. Um, I think that, I think oftentimes, like, this is gonna sound really bad. I think oftentimes we romanticize democracy and the ways in which like it is in fact egalitarian and I mean we live in a democracy ostensibly, right? Like the United States of America is what it's founded on. Um, and the interesting thing as a woman of color when Trump got elected was that it wasn't like there was a shift for most people of color. It was like, oh, you guys see it too, now too. <laughs> like, you guys finally now woke up. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. guys. Like, my sister is always like, you guys know the border thing has been happening like under Obama's era for a while, but Trump has sort of, it's been easy to, to like focalize on it. Um, and so I, I don't, I guess there is the idea that under democracy you can enact change through the system, um, but there is sort of no discussion of what happens when that system is inherently broken or when your democracy has been hijacked. And so I guess, like, are we talking about democracy, like early democracy or democracy in late stage capitalism or like how different is a democracy in late stage capitalism from a monarchy? Like what does it, what ma does it matter that it's ostensibly a democracy if your president isn't actually following any of the laws that are supposed to make it a democracy? Right. You know, like, what does that look like? And it sounds like, <laughs> I know it sounds like I'm being like, we should all violently rebel, and that's not what I'm saying, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. But I, like, I think that, you know, my, like my dad came of age, or was an adult, he was a Vietnam vet, and he was a militant black civil rights activist, and like in the 70s and 80s, he was like, we have to stockpile for a race war, you know? So like, that never happened, obviously, but it's like... You oh, can't blame him for thinking it was, Right, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Like, at what point... The, like, the, f the question for me is not, does it look different under a democracy or a monarchy or, or a fascist totalitarian government, but it's who's leading the rebellion and what are the resources that they have and what are their limits, right? Like, the marginalized communities that have lived in the United States have been pushed to the breaking point, and uh, any time that they've sort of formed a coalition that threatened the government, they were bombed or set fire or assassinated or, you know, that all sounds really bleak. <laughs> there's, there's no real resistance, but that's not what I'm saying. I, I don't think that it looks different. I think, I think to the majority in power who are at last being threatened or at last feel like they're being threatened in a very real way, it suddenly is like, maybe our government is broken and these are not the avenues that we can take anymore and we need to start thinking about real action. Right. Um, but I don't think that the shape of the government is the thing that affects the shape of the rebellion. I think it's the shape of the injustice and the 
and how far that injustice has gone. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I like what you're saying about laws and how to change them um, in, in The Incredibles 2, which is a really great movie, <laughs> if uh, you haven't seen it yet. Um, the two main characters, Bob and Helen, they have this discussion about um, when there are unjust laws, do you work within the system to yeah. break the law, uh, to change the laws, or do you break those laws? Yeah. And, um, anybody up here, like, how do your characters deal with that? Just, I, I really liked your, your comments, Sumaya, and I, I think that, you know, it is that in feelings of injustice. I mean, I've got five kids, and right. trust me, everything's unfair to them. It's like, you know, how yeah. come, <laughs> you know, you, you do this and that? And and even in, in, in my books and in, in my world, it's that injustice of, hey, the people with wealth and power are the ones that you rebel against because they want to keep and, and hold on to that. And, you know, I feel grateful to live in this country that I do. I mean, my my nephew is a is a missionary in Zimbabwe right now, and he got over there right before the coup started, um, and to read his letters every week and to hear what he's going through. And you know, he's he's white and he's of the minority, and the military was going house to house beating anybody over 15 years old, you know. Uh, and, and so living in a true dystopian society, it's terrifying. And, and to see you know, how people have to deal and cope with those things, it takes a lot of courage to stand up to when something's going on, when violence is happening uh, in your society. Um, I, I still feel grateful that you know, we're, we're where we are today, but it wouldn't take much uh, to tip the scales where people who feel like you know, violence is the answer is, it makes it a scary place. I mean, the other thing, too, is that, like, when America decides violence is the answer, yeah. we don't have problems breaking laws. Like, we, we break so many Geneva Convention laws when we're like, democracy is being threatened overseas. Huh. You know, like. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're right. Um, Jeff, you brought up the age of your, ch you have children, and, uh, you know, you have young characters in your books. Ashley and Lizzie, you have younger characters in your, your books. Sumaya, you too. Um, does the character's age affect how they respond to these types of things, and do you do you want to see more of that in in real life? I mean, we um, we have lots of youth activism right now. You know, I I, I kind of knew this question was coming, and I saw this great meme this week, which, as a parent, you know, I. Um, it says this, I want my children to be critical thinkers and to stand up for the things in which they believe, to defend their opinions and honor their values, but not at dinner though. Seriously, just eat what I made and shut up about it. Um, <laughs> and so yes, you know, I do, we, we do want our kids and then the injustice that I, I you know, teach my kids about, and this is whether it's in a small town in Idaho where I'm from or where we lived in California, we see bullying going on. Um, at, at all levels of, especially, I've got a junior high kid right now. Oh my gosh, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's horrible. So we, we do teach our kids to, to, to rise up uh, when, when somebody is being bullied or when they are being bullied, and, and, and they have been, to, to, to stand up and, and to, pr to protect each other um, and, and to, to look at that. And that's, that's happening in, 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 in a lot of our kids' worlds. Uh, right now, it's happening in a lot of our worlds today. So I, I look at my kids. You know, in in, um, in in the first book of my Harbinger series, the the protagonists are like 12 years old, and so I, I wanted to make sure that they weren't like the Luke Skywalker of the rebellion, because at 12, there's only so much you can do. But I wanted to make sure that the things that they were rebelling against, you know, the, the, the princess of the story is rebelling against having to do her homework, you know, and then they, against getting, getting taught things that she couldn't connect with and being refused to be taught things that she was interested in. It's like, well, tell me how come we have slaves in our society? Well, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about trade agreements. No, but I want to talk about the slaves, you know, and, 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 and uh, kids really want to know and they see and they observe these things. And in every book, these characters get older and older. And their experience with the injustices of their society and what they can do about it becomes bigger until finally uh, they, they can actually play a huge active role. And so I, I did that deliberately, making their impact smaller uh, and then and growing that impact as they got older in their stories. Yeah. In my books, there is no law. I mean, I, I've written a world where law is an idea from a long time ago, and instead what we have are the rules of our society. And these are the rules that your meme points out so artfully because patriarchy begins at the dinner table. <laughs> 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 
So in my books, we have all these rules of what women are supposed to do and who is a woman and what role that person takes in society. And these are rules that are extremely focused on who can reproduce and who should reproduce and who should be in charge of that reproduction. So in my books, there's an extreme lack of gender parity. Uh, after the plague, there is one woman left for every 10 men on Earth. And things get pretty ugly. I can see your faces. I know you know what happens. <laughs> And as that gets more complicated, so does the very idea of gender. So I think when we talk about law, we need to not only talk about the legislative bodies that tell us where we can go and, and deprive us of our freedom if we're wrong about that, but also the way we impose laws upon each other through social pressure and through our expectation of how people perform who and what they are. Do you have anything to add since you sort of write in the yeah, Our characters are 18, and you know we can we sort of do the opposite. In our story, um, the, the twins' father is the head of the family planning division, and so he's basically like the head of the SS. You know, and, and, and he's the one enacting the one-child policy law. He's the one going around Dallas and making sure that the law is practiced. So he keeps his 18-year-olds ignorant in order to keep them safe. So they know nothing about rebellion. What? So you said, yeah, that'll work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they grow up like it, it's all about secrecy and, and suppressing like what's really going on in the world and throughout as, and then it becomes important to them once they figure it out to be part of the change. Yeah, and then, you know, no, a lot, and a lot of themes on dystopian is young girls rebelling and, you know, if the more you can get that message out. And we like to hope that storytelling can inspire our future generations, um, you know, our children are the future. And if you can get them while they're young yeah. to think that they can rebel. And uh, our favorite quote is, even the smallest person can change the course of the future from the Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. So we hope to, to put that in there. Like the, um, what's the name of the 16 year old girl that got nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize today for her issues on climate change? She's badass. Yeah, she yeah. is. So, yeah, so, you know, if we can make, if uh, stories can produce more people like that, then, uh, yay. <laughs> so, uh, you mentioned the Nobel Peace Prize, and I kind of want to talk about protest and how protest works in your novels, um, and if there is a difference between violent and nonviolent protest. Is this a general question? Yeah, or? it's a general question. Um, People don't protest in my novel because they live under a dictatorship. Um, and when you're a colonial subject, <clears throat> you don't protest, especially when you're a woman and you're a colonial pro subject, you don't protest because um, you have a real visceral fear of the police and what happens when you get arrested for protesting. Um, but I think, again, that this comes down to like a race thing where like I don't like I didn't go to the women's march and, the, and like I live in Seattle. I didn't go to the women's march in Seattle because I was like, you know, all my white friends are gonna go and I'm gonna be the only brown girl there and I'm in a hijab, so I'm gonna get doxxed real fast. Um, but, you, like, when my sisters go to protests, my mother is super worried all of the time. Like, like, don't make sure not to catch anybody's eye, don't draw attention to yourself, don't scream, don't be loud. You know, um, she grew up in Morocco during the years of lead where, again, if you were a woman and you were arrested by the police for protesting against the king, bad things happen to you. Um, and so I think in terms of effectiveness, I don't know, like I, I think that there are such great places to demonstrate solidarity, but like Trump doesn't care that we're in the street marching en masse. And apparently none of our elected leaders do either because they're sort of like, like no amount of shame has mo motivated them to do the right thing, right? Like that's why we're at an impasse right now because doing, being a good person is no longer like, it doesn't matter anymore apparently. Um, which again makes it sound like I'm advocating for violent protests. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not. Very subtle. Because, because the other thing too is that doesn't work either. Like, you know, if you're, if you're white and you're violently protesting, then you're just protesting. And that still doesn't make a difference because what ends up happening is the few people of color in your, who are there protesting with you then become identified as looters and rioters. Or the protest gets written off regardless of race as a riot or a looting opportunity or something. Or a sports event. Or a sports <laughs> event, oh. God bless Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they call it when white folks riot. 
we we have a rich history in the city of Oakland of uh, both violence that is uh, yeah. violent protest and nonviolent protest, particularly because uh, o Oakland was the cradle of uh, the Black Panthers. And uh, the reaction to violent protest when it has a black face is very different than uh, than Philly tearing its city to pieces over sports. Well, it's called the race riots. Exactly. Like it they're is. not called. <laughs> <laughs> So I've become disillusioned with protest over the last few years for the reasons that you mentioned, because this administration is not vulnerable to shame, and because um, more and more those protests are not organized correctly so that we protect the marginalized among us. Uh, I have been more interested in uh, mutual aid, in uh, direct action toward uh, a, a a goal that you could define, like we're gonna clean up this park. Yeah. And in frankly, uh, organizing for the DSA. <laughs> That's the Democratic Socialists of America, for those of you who don't know. So, uh, Sumay, you mentioned colonization, and that's a big part of your book. And I just want to know, what does it take for your characters to overcome that oppression that they face and make a better life from themselves? What kind of sacrifices do they need to make? And what can we learn about our own history and how to better celebrate indigenous cultures? Amani doesn't rebel until she's given an opportunity, right? Like when you meet her in the beginning of the book, um, she's celebrating her coming of age ceremony with her family and her village. Um, and there's a moment where the Kesba where they're celebrating is stormed by the Imperial police. Um, and her brother makes a move to resist and she stops him because she understands the consequences of that. Um, and that's often the reality of being like living under colonial rule is that you weigh the cost and benefit of resistance and oftentimes the price is too high. Like there's, there's a reason colonialism survives so long. <laughs> oftentimes the price is too fucking high. Um, and it's only when she gets into contact with like an organized resistance force that she begins to think about like maybe we could overthrow our rulers, maybe we could uh, move on, but also at no point is she like, maybe our colonizers are good and will listen to our grievances, <laughs> right? <laughs> because she understands that that's not a thing. Um, and so I think, I think there is oftentimes like we're so we're so invested in the rebel narrative for a reason because it's uplifting and it's filled with hope. But the reality is that these regimes survive for such a long time because they're very very good at breaking up communities and preventing them from resistance. Like you have to be in a in a coalition to build a resistance, um, and they're very good at preventing that. And Amani is like her village is isolated. It's it's policed and monitored pretty like rigor rigorously. Um, and it's only when she leaves the village um, and enters a space where there's more opportunities for her to meet different kinds of people and different organized forces that she is able then to conceptualize a future where she can actively help and build a resistance. Um, and it's only when she's put in a position of power that that becomes a reality for her um, or, even, or a possibility, it's not yet a reality because um, we're just in book one, but it becomes a possibility for her. Um, and I think that that is something that's often lost. Like we all watched Kanye lose his mind on Twitter and talk about how oh, slavery was a choice, oh. right? And, but it's like, I mean, before Kanye there was Texas and their textbooks where we had migrant workers, workers. right? We had migrant workers. So, but it's the idea that like obviously this thing has persisted for such a long time and it had to persist because people were lazy or didn't want to do the work and it's, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> The police have finally come for me. <laughs> 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 um, but it's really that these systems are, are really good at doing what they do, which is keeping families apart and keeping communities broken up and breaking down resistance. Like, you don't want to risk any of the consequences. Like, there's a reason that, like, when my cousin goes out in a hoodie, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, right? We, like, our communities also self-police because we learn how to survive. Right, And so I obviously love writing this book and I love writing these series, but there's a reason why Emeni is 18 and has never considered rebellion until she's lifted out of one particular sort of surveillance and survival and given different opportunities. Ashley and Leslie, um, Sumeya mentioned migrant workers and immigration and you have a character in your story that it has that arc as well, and I just want to know, like, how do you deal with real-world issues like that within a science fictional setting? 
We have a character who, so our, uh, we wrote a story um, that has, it's an isolationist America, border walls and uh, no exports or imports. And we grew up in Texas, as we said, and I, we when used to visit there, the border yeah, wall. Whenever I was in my younger 20s, I lived, I was in Brownsville for two months on a film shoot. And then we stayed in a couple of Texas ranches on the border and when we were younger, and that was the first time that we fully heard people who were just straight up racist. And we, would, we heard the term illegal used as like a curse. And it was just so, it's such a dirty, they would say the illegals broke in and stole all of our water and they would self-police and have their guns to hunt all the people down that were crossing the border illegally from Mexico. And we decided that we wanted to have a character that would is considered an illegal. Is considered an illegal, and she crosses the border, and she gets introduced to our main characters, who the second twin in our story is also an illegal, um, and we just thought that it's interest. It'd be interesting to uh, try and have people who don't necessarily believe in immigration, and the future of uh, political and climate refugees that are going to need a lot of help, and have. People like our family read about <laughs> it's like our the theme of the family. People like our family who can read um, her and can identify, and can see the humans human rights issues that are just totally because just because they don't belong because of a border. Right. Um, I don't know. We hope that we got that yeah. across in our story, but uh, it was really important to us because seeing it so much in Texas. Right, and hopefully people can relate to what you're saying. Yes, I hope that they did. <laughs> awesome. So uh, we're also in Women's History Month, um, yeah. so I wanted to change track a little bit, and um, Meg, I wanted to ask you about gender representation and gender rebellion, rebellion in your books. Um, how would you reconcile writing what is uh, what I would call, anyway, feminist literature with characters that may not always present as female, and um, what do your books say to the gender <laughs> rebels of the world? Yeah, I faced a very difficult question uh, when writing, especially Flora, but all of my books, and the question is, what is a woman? Uh, those of us who have grappled with our gender identities have had to ask this question, not only what am I, but what is that? What is that thing, and how how well do I perform it and in what ways do I fail? Uh, Hannah Gadsby in her recent stand-up set Nanette said I am incorrectly female. And I think a lot of us identified with that for one reason or another because there are, there are certain societal and social roles that women are supposed to fulfill. And if you don't fulfill any of them or all of them or more than half of them, where does that leave you? Uh, I, I'm always uh, amazed at people who say that there are too many queer characters in any one book because it's just not realistic. <laughs> Because all of my friends are queer, and it's not just because I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's because people are coming to understand the spectrum of human sexuality and, and of gender. And we are long past binary here, but we continue to fight about it as though we weren't. So in my books, more than anything, what I wanted to do was explode the notion of gender. What if no one can do what a woman does? Who is a woman then? I look specifically at societies that have an extreme uh, unbalance of, of male and female, uh, primarily places where there's a one-child policy and people favor male infants, and in places where female infanticide is still widely practiced, and I looked at what happens after 20 years, after 40, after 100. What does that do to marriage markets? What does that do to people's ideas of monogamy? What does that do to your population distribution over time? And the answer is nothing good. <laughs> uh, Despite, uh, d aside from the imbalance itself, uh, violent crime goes up by huge exponential percentages every time you introduce uh, gender imbalance like that. So I could not help but write an extremely violent place in my books. And anybody who's been incorrectly female knows what that violence looks like. I just wanted to write about queer renegades. I <laughs> So I did. So, so it's a queer renegade world, and even within that, uh, we're not all who people think we should be. And sometimes we have to fight quite hard to become who we should be. And by the end of my books, my characters on the road to nowhere have gotten to do everything. I've gotten them in every shape of relationship. There's some really weird sex scenes. 
I've gotten them to defy expectations and take on roles that were never meant for them, go on adventures they never thought they'd have, because these are the stories that I wanted to see in the world. I remember when I first had the idea for the book of the Unnamed Midwife, it was as though I was looking at a huge bookshelf that had all these gaps on it for the stories that had not been told. And one of those gaps was this book. This book had to exist because I never read stories of, you know, the world ends and everybody's very concerned about continuing the species and somehow there's just enough heterosexual pair bonds standing around that we don't worry about it. <laughs> or everybody's too focused on slaying zombies and eating dog food to want to have sex. Neither one of those things will be true. Uh, the dystopia will have queers in it. All dystopias do, all utopias do. And uh, my book is all about them. I, I really like what you said about um, all the stories that had not been told. And I was wondering if anybody else is, is, what story that had not been told are you trying to tell with your book? Anybody? Ours was the relationship of twins. We've always wanted to tell a surprise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, telling a twin sister story was always, um, because in, in our experience growing up, twins are always sexualized or like Disney stories. So we wanted to tell an authentic twin sister story from our point of view, and our favorite stories are science fiction and fantasy. Mm -hmm. So that was very important to us. Yeah, we thought it'd be cool to have twins rebel, so it's like double. Yeah, exactly. Double trouble. Double, double trouble. Double trouble. Oh, <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. I like spent my whole life. I, I know. I hate that double. I, everyone who's like double trouble when they shout like this, and now here I am. Double, double trouble. trouble. Come on. Using that as a tagline, like, like book montage. three, double trouble. <laughs> what about you, Jeff? <laughs> how do you? I, I'm just curious how they wrote the book together, because you know, living with him. Thought. Like yeah. I can barely stand writing with me. With myself. Yeah. The how the hell do you write with someone else? <laughs> No, that's that's good. And, and and for me, the stories I've always wanted to tell are when I've read another book or I was a history major in college and I, I, I read a certain thing, it's like, I wish it didn't happen that way. It's like, I wish that, you know, I wish this person lived or I wish this, you know, I wish the story went that way instead. And, and sometimes it's maybe one word out of a Dickens novel or, or one thing from Terry Brooks that I've read that it, where it'll all of a sudden inspire an idea of I just wish that history could have happened a different way. And that's, that's primarily what I write, is, is taking that scene and just flipping it on its head and doing something different with it. Um, I'm a big Star Wars fan. Yeah. 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 Um, and I'm one of the few people who likes the prequel trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh -huh. That's OK. Um, <laughs> I know. Great lightsaber fights. Um, but uh, I really wanted. I really, ju I wanted brown people in space. Like I wanted Moroccans in space. That was basically it, right? Um, and because I, like for me, fantasy is about how we imagine our past selves, like how we create myth and legend about our communities. And science fiction is about how we imagine our futures, like what are the possible futures? And I get a lot of like, well, they wear all of this like old timey stuff and the old timey stuff is all Moroccan stuff that people still wear. Just FYI, <laughs> um, uh, and like languages that they still speak, uh, but I, I get a lot of like, if you have all this stuff, why didn't you just write it as a fantasy? And I'm like, I don't know how to explain to you like the ideological exercise of brown people can have a future in space. Like that's really <laughs> important <laughs> because space is not just Western or white. Um, and so like, like the fact that when uh, John Boyega got cast, people were like furious because they were like, there's no black stormtroopers. And I'm like, how do you know? <laughs> how the fuck do you know? You can't see their faces. <laughs> um, you know, and so like, I, yeah, I was just like, I'm so tired of these white futures or the idea that like, uh, there's a lot of like, It'll be great when we live in a time where like there's no culture and there's no religion. And it's like, you only think that because West is default to you. So you think that like the Star Trek pantsuit is culturally neutral, right? <laughs> like you think that that, and you think that everyone's like universal translator translating into English is like culturally neutral and it's not. And so I wanted to imagine a world where like, 
uh, Amani's people have like terraformed two moons and they have space flight and they've been colonized and that sucks. But also like the thing that Amani knows about her people is that they are culturally rich um, and that they manage to do a lot of stuff. Um, and I wanted to, to, like, for me, I was like, what happens when a culture that's religiously based, which is most cultures, like, takes off into space, and how does that morph with their mythologies? Like, how do they, how do they talk about that, and how do they think about their history in relation to science, and that sort of thing? Um, and boy, man, people are really, like, I remember I got a comment once, they were there, like, why are there farms? And I was like, Luke Skywalker is a farmer. <laughs> Moisture farmer, yeah. We have farms now. Where do you think food comes from? <laughs> so it's, yeah, so that's, that's the gap on the shelf, like basic sort of knowledge about possibilities. Very nice. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, <laughs> that's great, that's great. Uh, I'm curious if, if any of you write your own languages like within your books, because that I, I realized when you were talking mm. about language. Oh, I there's Arabic or there's there's uh, Moroccan slang Arabic, which is called Darija, which is incomprehensible to anyone outside of North Africa, and technically shouldn't be classified as Arabic, but it's only Arabic because of socio-political reasons. Uh, reasons. Um, uh, there's a lot of saucy poetry that yeah, from like 14th century. 14th century Muslim women were quite bold <laughs> in a way that, that I was quite shocked by. Um, so there's a, there's a lot, Arabic speaking cultures didn't have the novel until colonization and the mode of, the high mode of literature was poetry for a very long time and still is. Like I call my mom up to ask her questions about dead guys and she's like, why do you know who this guy is? Because she knows, because she grew up in Morocco and learned the Arabic canon, but she's like, why are you, why do you know who Ibn Zaydun is? And I'm like, he's the medieval sad man. This is where I go. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you should look him up. His, he got dumped by the daughter of a caliph and never got over her, and she took up with his political rival and got him exiled from the city. It's real sad. <laughs> he definitely did. Sounds he, like a book. He didn't deserve it, because all he did was laugh at someone else's joke. She was quite volatile, <laughs> so <laughs> she took it quite badly. I have dumped a dude for listening. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, so, so there's some classical Arabic and there's a lot of Darija, um, and the, the narrator of the audio book is Palestinian, so all of the pronunciation is like spot on. Awesome. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah. Nice. Well, believe it or not, I'm out of meaningful questions. Um, I want, <laughs> I was wanting to, uh, close out with a sort of a lightning round, so it's really silly, but it's also somewhat relevant to the topic because all of these character rivalries um, express different ideologies about rebellion. So, Ashley and Leslie, Team Iron Man or Team Cap? Oh, there we go. What's the second one? Iron, Cap was Iron Man. Just say Iron Man. Iron say Iron it. Man. Say it. Say Iron Man. Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, Professor X or Magneto? Magneto. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Meg, Superman or Batman? Oh God. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that I heard Wonder Woman. Okay, so I don't like either one because I don't like OP dudes who are completely uninteresting. However. Oh. Wow. <laughs> However. Has anybody read The Refrigerator Monologues by Kat Valenti? Yeah. yeah, there should be more hands. You should be reading it. Uh, she described Batman more efficiently than any author ever has. She called him the emo leather jock fuck muppet. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna go with Batman. <laughs> Sumeya, House Targaryen or House Stark? Oh no, that's actually really hard. <laughs> Can I cheat and say past House Targaryen, current House Stark? Sure. Yeah, that's what I'm going with. <laughs> All right. So we have about 15 minutes left, a little bit more than that. I wanna open up for Q&A now. Um, let's try to keep questions to topics that these panelists can actually answer. Um, this is an exaggeration, but no one up here knows when Winds of Winter is coming out. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, uh, first question, anybody? 
Do we have a mic? There's a mic on there. In the the there's right yep. there. Uh, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Uh, my name is Michael. I actually I run an anti-capitalist cabaret uh, down in Georgetown. Uh, and obviously narrative is important to everybody here. Uh, and the thing that I do in my show is it's actually cyberpunk. Uh, and the idea is using narrative to uh, open people's eyes to the situation that we're in. Because obviously we're in a cyberpunk dystopia if you guys don't realize it yet. <laughs> um, but that is real. It just doesn't look as cool. Uh, <laughs> but my question is... Uh, how can we as uh, story builders and as writers, and how do you as writers and story builders use your narrative uh, to push these ideas of resistance in a way that goes beyond something that can be used by the established status quo as a pat on the back uh, for people? Uh, and my best example is that the fucking neo-Nazis uh, that marched on the uh, Confederate statues probably all read ha Harry Potter um, and they probably all loved it. Uh, so how, how do you use those narratives uh, to actually inspire people to act and not just let them be excited for themselves for reading about a revolution and feeling like they did the work there? It's a pretty good question. I think the big problem with Harry Potter is that uh, Rowling shied away from saying what she meant a lot of the time. Uh, that's a constraint of writing for middle grade, of course, because you can't say something straight out. I mean, we couldn't have Dumbledore and Grindelwald fuck on the page, but... <laughs> Which is a different problem different than... Different problem. <laughs> but I feel like it's related, because right, yeah. it's the same problem is that she won't say what she means. So when she says uh, wizards who are obsessed... Wizards are obsessed with pure blood and with maintaining family lines and with keeping muggle-borns out and with keeping half-bloods out, what she means is wizards are racist. When she says, we have these house elves who are bound to Hogwarts, who are not free to leave, who must perform unpaid labor for us, what she means is, wizards have slaves. I feel like if she were to use more specific language, it would be harder for Nazis to think they were the good guys. I have endeavored in my works to be as specific as I could. I think the other thing, too, is, like, I've gotten responses. I don't know how many of you guys have read Mirage's line, if you haven't. Um, but it's I've gotten really responses. Good. You should read it. <laughs> yeah, you should. Um, <laughs> but I've gotten responses to it that's been like, this really taught me that if we just spent more time with people that were different than us, then we would get along more. And that is not <laughs> <laughs> what's happening in the book at all. But there are some ways in which you can't. And the not the the narrative is really explicit about it. Like, uh, but I think the other thing. I'm gonna bring Hosier up because if you haven't, yeah, if you haven't heard, read, listened to his album, it's amazing. But I saw a post on Tumblr <laughs> that was like, you guys are all harassing him for like this new album, but he's actually out there doing activist work. And that's, I think, the solution is that like narrative can only take you so far and you can't actually control your readers' responses. Like I can be as explicit as possible to be like, Marm is biracial and a victim of the occupation. Um, and this is why her relationship to Amani is complicated and readers will still be like, but she's white like us. Mm -hmm. And it's like, mm, okay. Um, <laughs> but what I can do is like put my money and my time behind like anti-fascist, anti-Nazi, like activist things. I can go out and like as much, you know, as much as I've been, mo been bemoaning on the panel that like shit's broken and there's so little that we can do. There is a lot of stuff that we can do and especially if you're white and straight and able-bodied, there's a shit ton of stuff that you can do that is more than writing the book, right? Like the, I'm a literature PhD, I think literature is necessary and amazing and our cultural bank and all of this other stuff, but this is not gonna, like some neo-Nazi in Idaho reading Mirage is not gonna finish it and be like, my mind has been changed. You know, like the guy, the guys, the guy, the guy that wants to string me up, up from a tree, like this is not going to change his mind, right? But I can go help get laws get passed that make that sort of sit, shit illegal, you know. Um, and I, I feel like I'm like the dystopian Debbie Downer of the panel. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a really hard three years. That's usually me. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> so, sort of along those lines. Um, is there stuff in stories you've read, other stories you've read, uh, about uh, resistance and rebellion that really you think they got wrong, that really frustrates you? 
Um, or is there stuff they left out that you've included, maybe included in your own work that you would like to see more of in, in, in stories of resistance? Every time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> Every time one of the colonizers is like, I've fallen in love with a native girl, and now I have learned that actually you guys are people too, I want to die. I had, I had to have a conversation with my editor where I was like, that's racist, <laughs> right? Like, are there kids in the audience? Okay, then I won't say what I was going to say. <laughs> but <laughs> um, that, like, that white dude that's married to a black lady that still says like the N-word on the side, the fact that he's married to a black lady does not make him less racist, right? Like, you, I guarantee you that that guy is like, she is a credit to her race and not the other way around. And I am so tired of reading this in fiction because it's always like, well, they need a general to do X, Y, Z. They don't. <laughs> and also he wouldn't because when it comes down to it, if it's between you and the regime, he's gonna pick the regime. <laughs> this is definitely my soapbox, but uh, there are a lot of stories in which there is no women's health care. And uh, there's a wonderful essay on the internet about how the rebellion was uh, desperately imperiled in Star Wars because Padme was just allowed to die in childbirth because she's sad. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not a fucking thing that happens. <laughs> so stories of resistance that discount the role of women and the, the role of people who aren't like uh, Alice's head dudes. Uh, are missing everything, fucking everything. Every single revolution and every single movement has been built on our backs, quite literally. So that's my thing. <laughs> I wanna thank you all for being here and I feel like I've really learned a lot, especially from Samaya. And I was just wondering if you have anything that you feel like we haven't touched on yet that you all wanna add to this conversation. I run my mouth too much, so I'll. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? Jeff? Leslie? I, I guess the thing that I, I always want to tell people is that there's something going on uh, in your local area, no matter what your local area is, and uh, you should find it. Uh, national politics are a horse race, and they're a distraction, and there's so much you can do by uh, volunteering at your library or finding your local Planned Parenthood or uh, helping register people to vote. Look, look to your own house first. That's the thing we always uh, don't say. Uh, so, you talked about this a little bit earlier, but for everyone else on the panel, I'm just wondering uh, what space queerness and queer characters occupy in your works and in your idea of what fictional resistance looks like or should look like? Not to me. <laughs> it's to anybody. It's to, it's to, it's to you, just to me. Um, I think every writer should write what they're passionate about and things that, that are of, of interest to them. And I find so much of the themes we've talked about today just repeated over and over again in history. Um, you know, when, when people have power, they don't want to let go of it. And, you know, resistance comes. And even in my books, um, I, I, they're, they're set in times where, where those issues aren't as prevalent just because of the way society was structured back then. But I still feel the themes of rising up and resisting against um, the status quo, it, it happens whether you're studying the Middle Ages or ancient China. It, you know, there are, there, are, there are cases for that everywhere. Um, so when, I, when I'm imagining space futures, I'm always like, mir mir well, Mirage is about colonization. Um, and so with queerness, I'm specifically like, especially queer people of color, go through so much shit. Like, why am I going to recreate homophobic standards in a space opera? <laughs> um, so you all, I think, are gonna be the first people to hear this if you haven't already guessed, but Maram is a lesbian. Um, and that's a pretty big through line of the second book. Um, and Writing it was really fun and really great, but also, man, 
some editors are so stupid. <laughs> and it was really hard. There was a point where there was a point where they where someone was like, I think that we should because she has POV chapters, right? Because I didn't want to write her POV. I didn't want to write her love story from Amani's point of view, who's ostensibly straight. Um, but her story was so much about like the ways in which people don't think about compulsive heterosexuality and how we are often there are so there are so many cases where people don't even consider that there are other options because we are raised and brought up to be like this is the path this is the choice it is a choice um and that sort of thing and so much about it is her coming realizing that it's the way that she is is not a choice and that she has possibilities for a happy future um and so much about of me writing it was about thinking about the ways in which there's only so much harm you can escape when you're already engaged to marry a guy in a patriarchal society but w how can the narr like how can the narrative alleviate the pain and the difficulties of that right and what does that look like and what does what does maram imagining for herself a happy future look like right in this in this sort of narrative, in a colonial narrative, and what imagined happy futures can queer people of color have under colonialism, right? Because I think that that's the other thing that gets sort of forgotten or left to the side is that colonialism sucks, but people of color and colonized subjects exist and manage to hold on to happiness and happy spaces and happy futures despite that. Um, and sometimes it's used as a justification for like, well, they're fine, so why are we fighting anyway? Um, but we do have to survive, <laughs> and we can't be miserable all of the time. Um, and so thinking about, I think so much of science fiction is thinking about imagined futures and what that, what that means in, the, in an ideological way, but also in a very real way, because if we can't imagine futures, then you're just sort of victim to the death drive, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think I rambled on for long enough. <laughs> Um, we have time for one more question, so go ahead. Well, mine's not that big. <laughs> bless you, bless you. Hi, I'm also from Dallas, so. Okay, hello. And, and my question kind of goes with like location and culture. Living in like Dallas and living like, and being deeply ingrained in like Southern culture or race culture, how do you, um, put that into your work as writers also with feeling ostracized from that because like y'all are from a southern community but yet y'all aren't like super super conservative like I'm necessarily like I'm black power all of the way but I don't necessarily agree with like all of the things of the black lives matter movement so I think like the disparity and how do you put that into your uh, books I think for us we fully understood whenever we left Dallas. So we, we moved, we went to Austin, and Austin's very liberal, and then now we live in California, and so I think we fully could understand the perspective and uh, the POV of the conservative Dallas. Do you still live in Dallas? No. Do you no. live in Seattle? <laughs> no. <laughs> no? Um, was e easier for us to write, and then because we have that background, I think that we can more get inside the heads of the bad guys. <laughs> I, I, uh, I can, I can no, not, I even, not the necessarily the bad guys, but people who have the different point of view. I feel mm -hmm. like I, we can um, infuse more about why they're doing what they're doing or yeah. why they say they're doing what they're doing and kind of make it more of a dialogue throughout the novel with the characters that can be more, so it's not so one-sided. We can kind of put in why they feel the way they do. Exactly, because nobody wants to be lectured to. Yeah. And like, especially mm -hmm. with how divided the country is right now, we can, I think that there is value in having understanding the other side and listening instead of just lecturing. and. That's what we're trying to infuse in our writing, is sort of having dialogue on both sides and, and, and listening. But being clear about who's the right side. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience. Once again, we have Ashley and Leslie Saunders, Jeff Wheeler, Meg Ellison, and S Sumaya Daoud. Um, please join us for autographing tables two and three outside. Um, I actually have to run to the live stage, so I won't be signing after this, but if you do want to get your copy of Mirage signed, I will be signing tomorrow at 515 at tables <coughs> three and four. Thank you.
Yeah. You too. I'm so glad we met. Yeah.